This is Ryan, the host of the Mad Data Podcast, where we talk to experts just like you that are using machine learning, AI, and of course, data to transform their business. So join us as we highlight the stories that are shaping the fields of data engineering, science, and analytics, both for today and the future. What's going on, everybody? Ryan back with the Mad Data Podcast uh, with Databan. I've got a very special guest on the line today as we talk about ML and AI and all things data. We got Joseph Machado on the line. Joseph, what's going on, man? I know we took a while to uh, schedule this podcast. There's a good reason for it, though. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, thanks for having me. I, I know it's been a while. I think for what, a couple of months now, uh, it's been like my on call and then <laughs> parental leave. So I'm I'm uh, glad it worked out finally, and glad to glad to be here. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's awesome, dude. You got you have a new child. You have a new babies. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, senior data engineer over at LinkedIn. Now you also have a uh, senior. You have to be a senior baby dad uh, <laughs> yeah. now that you uh, you have you have two jobs now on, on, yeah. all for, for the rest of your life now. Yeah, yeah, exciting, but also tiring. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about um, how to reduce data systems complexities. But before we get into that, I did want to ask you a little bit about yourself. Audience always loves to hear about our guests. Tell us a little about how you got into data engineering. What was your path to this? And obviously, we also want you to talk about some of the stuff you're doing on the side, uh, which is around your data engineering website. So go ahead and uh, give us a little background yourself, man. So I started off as a data scientist. Um, so I was doing like some analyses and I, I think it was like fraud detection back in the day. Uh, but I got pretty tired of like all the meetings and having to make presentations. <laughs> and I figured out I was more interested in like the engineering side of things, like building data pipelines. Uh, that's how I started off. And then from there, you know, I kind of get got some experience with like the big data tools of the day. Back, back then it was like, Hive, Spark, MapReduce, um, and then slowly went on from there. I went into Airflow, and then I went into a little bit more of the modern data stack, whatever that's called, like Snowflake, DBT. Um, so yeah, that's been my prog- progression, starting as a data scientist. I think that's a pretty common data scientist or data analyst moving into the data engineering role. Um, right now, I'm a senior data engineer at LinkedIn. Again, similar, similar jobs, like working with data pipelines. Um, the complexity of data is much higher here, um, especially because uh, we, the team I am on works with different businesses and tries to uh, kind of con- bring them together, which is always a tough problem. So that's what I do right now. Um, yeah, so on the side, I have a blog called startdataengineering.com. Um, so when I started it, during the pandemic, I was like, okay, I got a few hours of transit. <laughs> so what do I do with that? So that's why I started it. And um, I wanted to write something that actually had actionable stuff, if that makes sense. So like either a piece of code that actually works or a project that someone could actually do. Um, and I, I wasn't interested in all the thought pieces type articles. So there's a, there's a audience for that. But what I wanted to do was like give people something actionable. When they read a blog post, they should be able to do something different at their job or do some do a new project that they didn't know how to do before. So it's 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 supposed to be actionable. So that's what I strive for. That's that's my uh, blog post. Yeah, that's sweet. No, I'm all about the practicality as well. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm in I'm in product marketing, and so I see a lot of things that are said on LinkedIn or Medium blogs or uh, Substacks, and I just kind of roll my eyes at times. Like, okay, like what what do you what do you what do you want me to do with this? This is all theory and high level strategy it's it's not practical you're giving me like no examples you're not allowing me to really take to heart what you're saying so that's awesome you're doing that because i think that's a definitely something people appreciate is getting not just like people's advice but like practical advice yeah a lot of the blog posts i see are too vague or too kind of broad to be actually really helpful um so that's what i try to do yeah, man. Well, I mean, well, you may see now just everyone on the the podcast here, you may see a slowdown 
in his postings because he has a baby now. So give him yeah. space. <laughs> all right. We'll give him to the groove. And... Uh, that's funny because I try to post at least once every two weeks, but my last one has been <laughs> a month and a half ago because with baby, I couldn't. <laughs> I get it, dude. I've got, I mean, you talked, talked about this before we started the podcast, but I got two girls, six and five and one on the way. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's challenging, but they're great. No. It's a great. Cool. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's get into the topic today. So we talked about, we're going to be talking about how to, you know, basically reduce data systems complexities. And first I want you to talk about what are the things that when you think about data systems complexities, you've talked about, you have it in these like three different areas. We're going to walk through these different areas, kind of explain how you would walk through and navigate, like first discovering and navigating through these particular areas as it relates to like a data complexity. Yeah. So those three areas, it's kind of broad, but you can kind of think of these three areas as the stakeholder system. So these are like your Looker dashboards, your Tableau dashboards, or it can be APIs in some cases where you are serving data through APIs. And then the main system is like your data warehouse, like where your data is uh, served out of. It can be like data lake house, whatever you want to call it, just where your kind of uh, trans- historical data is stored. And then the data pipelines, like how you actually build the pipelines, uh, what are the common issues some like there are a lot of issues you can run into while building data pipelines. It can get significantly complex, then you, unless you're really kind of mindful about it. So those are like the three kind of main um, verticals I want to talk about. Um, now I have a question on that. I noticed the way that you structured that. You kind of started with when I and I don't know if you do this. Maybe this is like a Freudian uh, slip here or a Freudian thing here. But it was interesting because you started with. Um, talking about the stakeholder systems first, which is more on like the right side of like consumer. And then you said, then the middle, and then the third is the left, which is where, where the data like starts and begins. Is there a reason why, I'm just curious, is there a reason why you you, you view those data complexities from in that particular order? So that's a really good point. I, I didn't really think about doing that, but that's how I think uh, data engineers are supposed to think you start from, your end product, like what do you want to achieve? Like you want it to be a Looker dashboard or do you want it to be an API and then work backwards? So you got your stakeholder. That's why it goes from like stakeholder warehouse pipelines. Um, I mean, obviously the warehouse modeling is crucial, but like you also have to think about what your end goal here is. If your end goal is just serving systems, to serving data to uh, to your external client, you probably don't even need um, kind of a UI tool so that's why I go from like stakeholder, warehouse, pipeline. You know, you don't want to go from like this ingest everything in and then figure it out. You want to try to figure it out and then kind of bring what you need into your data warehouse. Um, so yeah, good catch. I didn't, I didn't really think about it while writing that, but yeah. No, I like that though because it's it's very much you know you, you're looking at it from what are the business objectives and business goals, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, the stakeholder is the ones that we really care yeah. about first, and yeah. so all the complex. We talk about all these kind of complexities, but at the end of the day, it's whoever's at the very end of that. They're the ones that are going to be raising it. So cool. So yeah. So tell us, like, what are some identifying factors that would indicate some of these data systems complexities? Yeah. So. I have a few points here, but the main one is if your pipelines are uh, finicky. So like you make a small change, everything breaks. Uh, so you, uh, engineers might know this. If you put up a PR, you miss a flag or you like forget to add a um, kind of entry in a list somewhere, your whole pipeline will fail. So those sort of things is like the identifying factor. You, I worked in a couple of places where if you don't tick all the boxes, you it will fail. And the, and the tricky part is that it's hard to automatically test those bo- test those things. So you there are cases sometimes when a new engineer comes in and they'll fail. Even people who have been working on it for a while will sometimes forget it and will fail. So those sort of like um, brittle systems is, is like the key factor. And then the other point is like your pipeline will break, your data pipeline will break. That it's like it's uh, it's like inevitable. But when it breaks. If it takes more than a few minutes to identify why it broke, that's a sign of like complexity um, and like unnecessary complexity usually because unless your bus- business is like multiple organizations working as one, if you're in a simple, straightforward organization, you don't really, you, your pipeline shouldn't take like many minutes, like more than 10, 15 minutes to kind of figure out where, where it broke. Um, so I can give you an example. I of complexity that I made up. So one of our API, we, we had a system where we were 
validating some data. So I built like an API endpoint that kind of validates the data. It uses this library called Great Expectation to kind of look at the data, see what the distribution of data is, all right, and put it put it up in a UI. So I, I built this like complex system where you trigger an API, it hits a Kubernetes cluster, spins up a cluster, puts up some data. And then I realized I did not even need to do this like complex spinning up a new Kubernetes style. All I needed was a simple API. It took like two seconds, uh, but I over-optimized it up front, causing a lot of confusion to other engineers. So uh, I learned from experience, try to do uh, the simplest thing um, before you optimize it. Um, so anyways, as I was saying, some identifying factors are pipeline breaks and it takes a long time. And then <clears throat> your end users uh, identify data quality issues before you do. Um, it, it happens sometimes, but if it happens uh, frequently, there's something wrong with your pipeline. You need to add some testing because, like, you don't want w w the worst thing that can happen is the end users use your data to make some decision and then realize the data is wrong. That causes a whole slew of like downstream issues. Sometimes companies lose tons of money on that, so you want to be careful about that. And then there's like permissioning issues. So if you create a new data set, it should automatically be properly permissioned. Sometimes it isn't. Um, and it causes a lot of kind of complexity and um, time to market, if you will. On the, the the end users noticing data quality issues, I think I remember there was a report on, I think it was from Fivetran, and they basically had a report that basically said like 71% of all business or you know decisions that are going on that they have, I think it was something like, are related to dirty or error prone uh, data like so at 71% of the time when you are making a decision 71% 70, of that time there's an issue with the data which is kind of wild like that was like, I thought I was like whoa so um, I'll have to make sure that's a that's the actual quote but I'm pretty sure that's what it was and there's something like something crazy like 85% I think believe also make bad decisions that will impact revenue which is also something you just said too so there's a lot of data out there that can that shows about data problems, <laughs> data quality problems. Hey, that, that's one of the reasons like all the data quality tools have become really popular because people realize it's a it's a hard hard problem to solve. It's and it's not straightforward as well because the quality identifying quality the data quality issues it depends a lot on what your business KPIs are. Or if you define a metric a certain way, you have to kind of write tests for that. So that's why uh, data testing is getting pretty big these days. Um, another thing of data system complexity is as an engineer, you cannot test locally. If you cannot test locally, it's going to be really difficult to um, iterate fast and deliver uh, fast. If, if you can't develop locally and if you can't test locally fast enough, that's going to be really difficult in uh, kind of making your deploying faster and releasing features. Question on the testing part real quick, and I know you have a lot more to say because I this is good. Stuff. I, did, I did want to ask you a question on the testing part. Is there a point where you think um, there is a, there's kind of like this uh, risk versus, re, not risk, I guess opportunity versus reward in terms of how much testing you can inject into your data process without having to think about, okay, is this going to slow down anything or I have to, we have to maintain these tests like over time? Like, does, do you have like a, a certain way when you think about like how much testing is enough versus how much testing is maybe overkill? That's a good point. The way I typically think about it is like if you're right, it, it depends on your data pipeline. If you're writing it in like Python, it's easy to write like unit tests and integration tests. But if you're writing it in SQL, it's really hard to write uh, test, test for SQL. So that's why DBT is very popular because it makes writing tests easier. Uh, but with regards to like a lot of tests versus um, not enough tests. It's like comes back to the whole kind of idea of like TDD versus non-TDD. People prefer either. I tend to lean towards a little bit more testing than no, uh, but it's it's everyone's preference. Uh, but I do I do understand what you mean, and I think like if if done the right way, testing does not need to be like super painful. It can be seamless, but you need to invest time and effort in like setting up that framework properly. Um, and, and again, that's why DBT is popular because it sets that up for you and you don't have to worry about all these like infrastructure issues. So. Okay, so we, you, last time we talked about, you talked a little about um, multiple tools, unmanaged permissions. I think the next we're going to get to was talking about 
right here I say like forgetting a flag. Is that like a what was tell me tell me what that means? Yeah, um that's what I spoke about in the first so like if you're making a new if you're making a change, um there are certain pipelines where you have to make if you're if you're just like let's say ingesting a new um CSV, right? You'll have to write a file and then you'll have to add like entry somewhere. Um I don't know how to explain this very clearly. It depends on the system, but like if you're if your pipeline is not well written, it's not modular, like you have to make changes in multiple places for one pipeline to work. That's typically a <clears throat> indication of complexity. Um, so I, I've, I've been in places where you have to make changes in like three places for a pipeline to work or three repositories to be more specific. And it's you typically don't want to do that because like you know you have three repositories and then you have to deploy them in a certain order and it just like slows everything down. Uh, but I have seen that in multiple places. And the reason for that is in data engineering, you have like the logic and then the scheduling layer are usually separate. Um, so yeah, uh, depends on, on the pipeline. But when when you notice you have to make changes in multiple repositories or multiple places, it's typically um, a bad idea. Yeah. The last one is in, when things get <laughs> too complex and development process gets slow, engineers get frustrated, and uh, when the leadership is not open to change, people just quit. It's, I've seen that time and time again. Yeah. Like, I think that, that holds true with, like, I think every uh, profession, you get burned out, you're tired of doing things, you're like, all right, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm just going to yeah, figure exactly. it out. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and the tough thing, it's, it's a tough problem, right? Like, in, in the tech industry, people only stay for, like, what, two years? And in two years, it's hard to build like a cohesive vision for your data platform. Like it depends on like the leaders and they should have like a cohesive vision. Um, but sometimes the people who join as engineers, they want, they have their vision, they try to implement it and then they leave halfway. And then the next person coming in was like, okay, it's something else. And then now you end up with a mess because the, the way to do things has, has been uh, changing so much. You don't have like a well-oiled machine. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, and and it's that's even like in things like security as well. Like I, the last company I was at, that was a common problem. It was we had um we we were a uh, public key infrastructure PKI as a service company, and you know PKI has been around forever, right? And so those expertise, if somebody leaves and you know, they're trying to do something around certificate management or they're trying to maintain their you know existing PKI, they were to leave. Everyone's like, well, how do we keep this thing going? Like, well, who's going to pick this up? So it's like you have all this really rich knowledge that if somebody leaves like that, it's like, OK, we're, we're like back to zero right now. Uh, so I totally get that. Yeah, especially the engineers. They are, you know, engineers are hot commodities. I mean, we, we they need them. And, um, you know, it's it's enticing to move in your career, for, definitely if you're an engineer. It makes sense to move as well. You get so much more money than just staying. It's like, right. I mean, yeah. That's that's like the no-brainer one. Yeah. So, and that's what's so weird. That, I, and this is like a little sidetrack. And we do this a, a lot of times in our podcast. But that's actually, you know, an interesting point, which is everyone talks about, you know, it's easier to um, grow an existing customer than land a new customer. Everyone understands that, right? But the same way with em, 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 employees. It's like it's it's way more beneficial to grow the people in your current organization than to have them leave. Then you have to backfill that person, and then you have to you know train that person. It's like you know if companies are, and I've seen this a little bit more. They're starting to put in more uh, retention hiring, or sorry, retention allocation for. Um, uh, their current staff versus net new hiring budget for their for you know new positions. It's like look internally first and get those people to be you know look to retain them because I mean what's going to happen? Like you're gonna you're gonna, you're gonna ask, you ask for ten dollars more. Okay, great. Well, if that they don't if you don't give them that ten dollars, they're gonna leave. And guess what? That next person you hire to replace that person. Or probably ask for ten dollars as well when they go through the interview process. So it's like, what? I don't understand that either, to be honest. But I, it's like, I guess business is business. So that's why we should be ahead of HR at all of our companies. You know? <laughs> Engineers should yeah. rule the world. But uh, oh, I don't know about that. But <laughs> <laughs> that probably wouldn't work out. Absolutely um, not. <laughs> 
as we talked through, you you kind of laid out these these three systems, right? The stakeholder systems, the warehouse systems, the pipeline, and then we kind of listed some of the areas of identifying factors that would tell you, hey, there's a lot of these complexities kind of going. You may want to pay attention to those. Can you walk through each of those kind of three there, and we can talk through what those may uh, may areas may uh, bring challenges? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I mean, let's start with the stakeholder systems. Right? These are usually like your Lucas, your Tableau, your uh, what else, like Metabase and Superset, all those sort of things. And people who use these are, they range, right? They range from like business people who don't write SQL, who just drag and drop these different fields in the UI, and people who actually write SQL. Uh, so like data analysts or uh, business uh, business intelligence people, they, they tend to write more SQL. Uh, but those are like the personas of people who use these systems. And <clears throat> what what happens is, as people start using them, they create their own dashboards and then they share it across leadership. And then someone else creates the dashboard, but then their metrics change. Like someone defines percentage as, I don't know, a simple example is like A minus B by A. The other one defines it as B minus A by B. Or, you know, the percentage change, you know, which row would you consider as a percentage change? So that simple change can cause like, now you have like metric, you know, the same metric that's supposed to be the same number is different. And then people tend to invest a lot of time in kind of investigating why this is happening, why, where did the data issue arise from. So that that I've seen that in all the companies I work for, and it's very time consuming and uh, kind of difficult to do. Because what, what I gave is a simple example. Now imagine like layers and data of this complexity on top of each other. And then uh, management saying like, oh, this is super important. We have to get the right answer now. And you're under a lot of pressure. You don't know what's going on. <laughs> so, and you didn't write this code. So you, it's, it's, it gets really complex. Right? So whenever you push uh, metric definition to the BI layer, it becomes really difficult uh, to manage. Um, so that's where these things called metrics layer are coming up. I don't know if you have heard of that. So like, do you know, um, uh, Max from, uh, preset Max, uh, Bushman. Oh, preset. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. He's the one who wrote our flow, right? Like, no. yeah, yeah. Maxine. He's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love Max. Yeah. He was on our podcast. He was on our podcast twice. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, recently he talks a lot about this topic. Yeah. The metrics and semantic layer and like, yeah, he's, re- he's got, he's a big thought leader in that space. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he he runs uh, Superset. I mean, the open source version of Preset, so that makes sense. Um, yeah, like <clears throat> as you might know, it's like the metrics layer is becoming huge. Like Superset is doing it. I think uh, Metabase has is bringing it up. <clears throat> DBT has its own metrics layer. I think it's still in beta. I'm not sure if it's released yet. So everyone is trying to get in on that. Basically, what it will do is it will bring your <clears throat> it will take away the kind of metric definition away from the business user to the engineering side, allowing um, business user to just use that data instead of having to create it themselves. And when you create it yourself, that's when things get complex. Um, And this also benefits like engineers because sometimes engineers use the same, or application developers and engineers use the same metric. Now they don't have to, again, write their own definition. They can just pull it from this metrics layer. So that's something I see happening um, across across companies kind of kind of realizing you need a single source of definition instead of having it in multiple places. Um, so that that's the usual complexity in um, stakeholder system. The other thing is every business, or not every, most business intelligence tool have their own kind of SQL <laughs> variant. I don't know if you know, like Looker has LookML, which is uh, very complex, or not very complex, it's very confusing. Um, for someone from like the SQL side or engineering side to kind of understand. So uh, ultimately, I feel like the goal of every vendor is to bring more usage to their system and they keep adding more features and features. Sometimes it's not beneficial to us. So we need people who kind of say like, hey, no, stakeholder system, it's not supposed to do this. We'll do it on our layer. So that's, that's where I think like strong engineers and people who actually know all these systems and how they work with the together and how kind of project kind of see how it's going to be used in the future they need to come in and say like hey no we need to kind of draw a line this is what we don't do and this is what we do um so yeah that's that's a big issue with the bi tools i've seen we talked about tools in general uh before we got on this podcast as well about how there's like an insane amount of data tools out there 
And I think BI tools are one of the most saturated <laughs> in the market, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. If you want a way to report something, let me tell you, I've got a little pretty graph <laughs> thing I can look it up into to show you it. Well, let's talk about the, the data warehouse layer. Let's talk about that layer. So the other, I mean, this is kind of key, right? The data warehouse layer is where all your data lands. It has to be, it has to be accurate and it has to be modeled well. Um, something that has surprised me over and over again is like people don't model their data, right? And modeling is not like super complex either. You just have to understand like certain facts and dimensions about your business. There's this book called Data Warehousing Toolkit. You read that and then you just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very straightforward. It's not like super complex. Well, I was going to ask you, why do you think, uh, why is that still surprising you? Like what's going on that makes people not do the right thing, I guess, in modeling? I, I think there is a, there are like two major reasons. One is like people don't know that there exists like this book that can kind of get you like 90% of the way there if you just follow it. And the other thing I think is like urgency. The business is like, oh, we need it fast. Oh, we need it today. We need it yesterday. That's my, the term I hate the most. We needed it yesterday when you're telling me today. Um, so th those two are the main reasons, I think. Uh, but I think like everyone should kind of read the Kimball uh, Data Warehousing Toolkit book. Um, some of it is doesn't apply anymore because they were optimizing for cost, but now like storage cost is super cheap. So, but it's still a lot of it, like facts and dimensions and uh, slowly changing dimensions. Those are still like really valid to this day. Um, so just read that. And then maybe um, in mom, like data mart stuff, you're, you're set pretty, pretty well. Like I, I would say like, it'll put you in the top 5% at least of good data modeling. Um, the, the the tricky thing about data modeling is like you need to understand how your business works first before you start your data modeling. Um, so like how how does your business make money? What are the processes that happen in your business? For example, in e-commerce, it's like checkout. So if you think about checkouts, right, there are like two levels of data. It's like our granularity. Um, so like you have in each checkout, you have like a checkout like an order detail. So it could be like, oh, this order was placed for this many bucks on this day. And then there's like item level information. So you got to like kind of think about these nuances. And then there might be like item discount. And then there might be like different taxes for different items. So thinking about that um, takes a time and also takes a lot of talking to with your business users. So I think that's something that needs to be done upfront. And it's easier to do it upfront than change it later downstream. Because if you have to change it, now you have to change the downstream consuming system sometimes and it just gets really messy. And one of the key reasons for complexity is like people rush this to get their results, which they do at first, but then after a few months or a few weeks, you wanna you want to do more analysis, you wanna change the um, kind of meaning of certain draws and it gets really tricky. That's another reason for complexities I've seen quite often. Data Warehousing Toolkit, who's that by or what, what's the... It's the Data Warehousing Toolkit. It's by uh, Ralph Kimball. He's like known as like the uh, guy who invented like data warehouse modeling. Gotcha. Um, it's it's quite, it's not super recent. It's like more than 20 years old right now, I think. But it's still pretty, pretty solid. Well, that'd be good for people listening to like, you know, even some of the old stuff out there is good to... Uh... Because you're saying, if you're telling me that I can get to, you know, 80 to 9% of what I need just by following some of those fundamentals, then people should be, you know, perking up and listening to it. Yeah, that, that, I, I always recommend that book to kind of anyone, like even in interviews, right? If you go for data engineering interviews, you get a bunch of questions that relates to that. So Yeah, on, in interviews, all you have to do is just uh, repeat stuff that you've read and sound like you're an expert, you know? That's, like, <laughs> that's yeah, the most part of the I, interview. Books are books are one of my favorite uh, kind of resources to get you the to the next level quicker than you having to make all the mistake and relearn things a hard way. Well, okay. So, any other things you notice in the on the warehouse side before you move on to data pipelines? So, on the warehouse side, again, the there is like premature optimization in terms of cost. So, like I I hear a lot of noise about Snowflake being super expensive, uh, but it is. Uh, but co compared to the cost of engineering ours, it, I would say it's still not as expensive as people make it out to be. Um, I, I do understand that if you abuse it, like if you run tons of testing on it all the time and like a ginormous warehouse uh, size cluster, yes, you're going to have more costs, but there are ways you can reduce that. 
Um, but p you don't want to like overly optimize for that and be like, oh, I'm not going to use Snowflake. I'm going to use like something like, I don't know, write my own Python uh, transformer. It will save money. Well, yes, it might. But then now you have to figure out how to deploy it, how to run it. And then you have to test it. You have to develop it. And it's like a lot of um, costs associated with that as well. And for a lot of startups who have money, but not time, you just want to get stuff out quick. So um, I've seen people over-optimize for that. Um, you probably want to kind of figure out what your business needs are at the moment and try to optimize for that instead of like optimizing for uh, transformation efficiency. If that one. So last on the list, uh, which is where you're at kind of, or you deal with a lot, data pipelines. I know, you do, I know you're probably all over the place, but uh, traditionally data engineering teams are the, captains of their data pipelines so to say for sure um so data pipelines <clears throat> maybe we can talk about uh batch first right so like when you think about data pipelines these days there's like a huge divide i feel like like there's people who want to write like pure code but not pure code by code i mean like in spark or scala or python and then there are people who want to do like sql it's almost becoming like a sector saying like oh sql is not testable oh python is slow there are pros and cons but like that i want to talk about that because like i see people arguing over that but then there is also a case where you have to kind of determine what's best for what's the best tool for your use case like you can't you, you shouldn't write Python code to do like common, like standard group bytes on terabytes of data. You just use your SQL. And that that's another reason for complexity I've seen in data pipelines. Like people want to do everything in Python and like you, you shouldn't have to do everything in Python because your code is not going to be as optimized as C uh, SQL written in like C, C++ or Java, depending on your engine, right? So that that's another issue that causes a lot of time to develop and also your code is not going to be like super optimized and it's not going to be always correct like sql like sql is pretty standard so i've seen like this kind of like sec mentality there so try to avoid that and go with sql when you want to churn out tons of data or go with python when you just want to operate on one draw at a time um, the other thing is again not having proper infrastructure for local testing um, so if you have like a Snowflake cluster, right, you, it's hard to test locally. That's why people use dbt. You can test locally easily. So making sure that developer ergonomics are well set up is, is crucial as well. Because one of the things data engineering is known for is like running a pipeline and waiting for hours. Uh, you want to have something local so that you don't wait for hours and at the last step it fails. Right? It's kind of frustrating and wastes a lot of time. Um, the other one is like again going to the whole like using Python or Scala thing, over optimizing on like web development practices. So in web development, you have like um, ORMs, you have reusable code everywhere, and you have like what is that called? Like it's like a specific pattern. People use like data access objects, data uh, transfer objects. It's it's like how you define your uh, data as in your web development system. But when you bring that to data pipelines, you don't really need like need to spit up a query into like three pieces and reuse it everywhere. You can just like write a standard query. So kind of making those trade-offs and knowing when to make those trade-offs is uh, where I see a lot of issues too, because like people either tend to over-optimize or under-optimize. But it's, it's it's a hard line to define because it comes with experience. Um, I cannot tell someone, hey, what to do without actually knowing what their entire data pipeline is. Um, the other thing is like, you know, standard things like, try to use the auto formatter, try to do some testing on every pull request. Not having those will cost you a lot of headaches because if it fails in production, now you'll have to redo it all over again. Yeah, you don't want uh, the failures in production is probably the, the the number one thing you want to avoid. Pretty stressful because like everyone's like, oh no, data is failing. It's like, okay. <laughs> Have you ever have you been on the have you done the uh, on call train of oh, being yeah. yeah of course you have wow well, I should even ask that question of course you have that that's the reason I had to move our call like I was on call because I don't want to um, remember our first we were supposed to have this call up yeah that's right yeah you said you're on call yeah on call is rough on call is rough because like especially if you're like a new engineer you need to kind of figure out what's what's going on <laughs> and then figure out what the issue is hey uh you're up you're on call from uh, 1 a.m to uh, 5 a.m night what am i on call for i don't know figure it out <laughs> you'll get you'll, you'll, you'll 
you, we will tell you what you're on call for. But I also feel like on call was the best way. I got to learn a lot of things, but yeah, in in the worst way possible, you know. <laughs> Best way, yeah, the best no. way possible, if that makes it's sense. It's really like throwing you into a fire, yeah, but you gotta, yeah. you gotta figure out a way out of it, right? But it's yeah. the best way to learn at the same time, right? Yeah. So I remember I back in the day when I was a software test engineer, I had to do, I was on call for production deployments for whenever we did you know major pushes to prod just in case to do any of the UAT testing and the the, uh, the you know production testing as soon as it got pushed out. Cause I did all the testing prior, you know, and staging. So it was like, I was the first line of person to go into prod and then make sure that everything was okay. And then I'd also at times had to be the unfortunate person to say, Hey, uh, there's a bug. Those weekly or bi-weekly pushes are rough because you got to do a bunch of testing. Yeah. Well, good times. <laughs> good times. <laughs> good times. Good times. Yeah, my final thing is with data pipelines, try to make the pipelines not produce duplicate data in case you run it multiple times. It's also called as item potency. Um, it's a lot of data people are familiar with it, but basically if you run your pipeline two times, the same input, it should not like create twice the data. That, that's basically it. Um, and also kind of make sure your data pipeline can run independently. Uh, what that means is, if you're running a data pipeline for a certain input, let's say day one, and if you run data pipeline for day two, shouldn't um, kind of collide. Cases There are some cases where it's, it has to, but most cases it shouldn't. Like if you want to do like some sort of look back reconciliation, it has to, but like in general it won't. So those are my tips for uh, keeping the data pipelines kind of simpler. Yeah, but it, it's ine inevitably gets complex. That's just the like nature of software, you know, like over time it just gets complex. It, it's up to the engineers to kind of refactor, think through things, kind of keep it simple. Yep. Well, I appreciate you walking through all those. I think I think it's, I, again, I, I think it's cool that we, in this podcast, we have to talk through you kind of dice, you know, layering in the different layers of where things could go wrong. You got the stakeholder letter, layer, warehouse layer, pipeline layer, knowing that the stakeholder layer is like, the number one thing that we need to be you know focused on but and then walking through some examples of how to how to reduce some of those complexities so i really appreciate you you walking through those but saying all that we said a lot what would be like the one thing that you want listeners to take away from today well i i want to say two things but yeah okay the you first, do, thing, fine. first thing is um whenever you're building a data pipeline uh, think from the backwards uh, like start with your end goal like think backwards right like so what is, what are you trying to achieve right and also make sure when you're thinking through things there is only one happy path like everything has to go well for this to work but there are multiple things that can fail always think through these like failure paths because there's as i think someone told this to me there's one happy path there are multiple failure paths think through that and try to avoid adding new systems or new patterns unless absolutely necessary uh, because that will kind of create a lot of confusion. You want your systems to be as simple and boring as possible, while also hitting your SLAs. That that's pretty much it. That, those are the two things. Sweet man, yeah, no, the happy path. Uh, I like that. I liked that saying. There's one happy path, but there's multiple bad paths or disaster paths or issues that it could go haywire, right? And so thinking through all those different types of risk scenarios is. Uh, it's important to keep those things going. Um, well, dude, how can uh, how can people be connected with you? Is it LinkedIn on your Substack? Like, what? How can people stay connected with you? I have a LinkedIn. I mean, it's like Joseph Machado. It's my name. Um, just say Joseph Machado space LinkedIn on LinkedIn. You'll find my profile. Um, I also have my, I run my own blog, um, startdataengineering.com. I'm a, somewhat active on Twitter, but mostly LinkedIn uh, because LinkedIn I can but like longer format content. So yeah, mostly LinkedIn and uh, my blog. Sweet, man. Well, hey, I really do appreciate you coming on the Mad Data Podcast. I know it took a while, but again, congrats on the new baby. Thank Very exciting. Thank it's you. a lot Thank of you. fun, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's wild and crazy, but it's a lot of fun, man. Um, and hopefully we can do this again, but uh, congrats on the success. Definitely check everyone on the podcast out here. Definitely check out Joseph's Substack. Uh, it's not a sub stack it's just like oh just website look at that he's got his own website look at that he's got his own website one of the sub stacks though no, uh no sorry 
it's just startdataengineering.com. Yeah. Uh, you can skip the sub stack and then also check him out on LinkedIn for all the posts he does on LinkedIn. And again, Joseph, thanks so much for being on and we'll talk again soon, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I know it's been a while with our scheduling. Thanks for working around that. And it was great speaking with you, Ryan. Right?